together we'll arise and reach out to all the nations as we are one in you gentile and jew for the key of abraham has been given to mankind and the key of abraham opens all doors for the key of abraham has been given to Hallelujah. Shalom everyone from the Embassy of the United Nations for Israel. Today we have the message that can make it or break it for the end time revival. And this message is the exposure of replacement theology as a major stumbling block on the road to advance and to awakening, to revival, and for nations to become sheep nations. In John 8, verse 32, it says, And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. There is nothing that can make us free apart from the truth. Everything else is a band-aid. Now, before I proceed to expose what replacement theology is and how it has affected nearly every denomination of Christianity and how it shows up throughout history as a hideous five-headed monster that steals and kills and destroys, I want to read some excerpts from my book, The Map Revolution. Now, this particular book was written, and been known to me when I was writing it, for the purpose of releasing it during the centennial of the Azusa Street Revival. That is the revival in Los Angeles, California, from where both the Pentecostal and the charismatic movements eventually were launched, and then the prophetic and the apostolic, and every other move full of the power of the Holy Spirit. That revival happened in 1906. And in 2006, Abba Sheba Shemaim, our Father in Heaven, sent me and my team to go to the Azusa Street Centennial. Prior to that, he downloaded on me this particular book called the Map Revolution or the Messianic Apostolic Prophetic Revolution and eventually told me that this book should be given for free or should be available for free for all pastors, leaders, bishops, archbishops in the body of Messiah worldwide. And the way we did that to obey this instruction was to actually put it for free in our website. And so you're going to see right here in this program the address of the website, how to download that book, The Map Revolution, for free, and it is in many languages. Therefore, anyone that you know that speaks another language can do exactly the same. A lot of things that I will be speaking about today, I certainly will not be able to cover it in just uh, one or two TV programs. This is a matter that's been going on for more than 1,800 years with quantities of lies. But a lot of the things that I am talking about today, you will find a more expounded even in my book, The Map Revolution. That is a free download. So make sure that you go ahead and download that book and then check all my other books in that website. They are not for free, but they are going to be able to school you in this matter so that you can be a vessel full of honor and glory for the end time awakening and the end time revival, what I call the revival of the third day or the revival of the third millennium. I am both an Archbishop of TAPAC, Transatlantic and Pacific Alliance of Churches, and of my own ministry, but I am a Jewish Apostles first and foremost, sent out of Zion in 1990, and I've been traveling the nations together with my beloved husband for nearly 30 years now. 
and I've traveled to more than 50 nations and hundreds of cities after numerous visitations of the Almighty concerning replacement theology and how this has stopped him from possessing his house altogether. How this has stopped him from making the bride pure and holy, ready for the glory. And that bride is also the one new man that is mentioned in Ephesians chapter 2. The one new man that is comprised between Jew and Gentile. This particular theology called replacement theology has actually absolutely been the stumbling block before the unity that we all are yearning for. There is no program that is going to succeed until Jew and Gentile can be one in the Messiah, in the same gospel, on the same foundation as preached by the Jewish apostles 2,000 years ago. I happen to be in the 21st century, a female version of some of those of the first century. And I'm going to therefore start with some words from my book, The Map Revolution, but not much of it, so make sure that you download the book. The Pentecostal and the charismatic denominations were born out of the Azusa Street Revival in LA in 1906. Now it's time to move on to the revival of the third day. Since the Azusa Street Revival in 1906, there is a variant that we have to reckon with if we are to see the next wave of revival. Israel has come back to life. The Jewish people are again living in their own promised land after 2,000 years of painful exile, and Jerusalem is again its capital. There are more Jewish believers in Israel today than any time in history apart from the first century. Any revival now will be contingent on how the international community of believers relates to Israel and all that Israel represents, a holy people and the holy book. While there is a lot more to talk about, I'm going to declare something that will accompany us throughout this program. And it is the 21st century like the first century. In other words, we need to go and revisit the first century so that we can understand where the 21st century has to move on after 20 centuries. And out of them, nearly every one of them had some hint of what I call, and many people today, and even scholars and theologians, have already named replacement theology. Replacement theology began to already work inside of the church in the first century when there were more Gentiles that were coming in to the flock. You need to realize that the first century church, the first century church or the first first century church was Jewish. And they met in Jerusalem, Jerusalem. There's even been pottery found in Mount Zion here in Israel that it is believed to be pottery that was used during the time of those believers that met here in the holy city of Jerusalem. There was a revival here. If you go to the book of the Acts of the Apostles, you are going to see when you read Acts 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and 8, you're going to see there was a revival going on in Jerusalem. Many, many priests even were believing in the Messiah, Yeshua. And at that time, the church, or what we call the church today, but I'm going to call it the Kehilah, or the congregation of believers, was Jewish. And not until Cornelius receives the gospel from Peter, you have to jump all the way to Acts chapter 10, not until then, we really have many Gentile believers that come into the fold and that believe in the Messiah, Yeshua. And I'm going to especially mark the name 
Yeshua. Because at that time, he was not known as Jesus Christ. That came a lot afterwards. At that time, the believers in the Messiah, both Jews and the Gentiles that came out of Cornelius' salvation experience and all of his family and all of his friends, they would call him with exactly the same name that the father called the son. The father didn't call the son by a Greek name. He called his Jewish son, the only begotten son of the father, by a Hebrew name. And the Hebrew name is Yeshua. That means salvation. And it implies the whole gamut of redemption, healing, and deliverance, and restoration. Yeshua has been the name that the father called the son is the name and will be the name forever and ever and ever. But through replacement theology, many things were replaced. And among them, the mighty name of the Messiah was replaced as well. And right as we start this expose on replacement theology, I want you to know that there is no one that has the authority authority to change the name that the Father called the Son. The name Jesus Christ is a transliteration of the name Yeshua. It's a Greek transliteration, which means trying to apply a name that will be more easy to use for people maybe that are in Greek, in Greece or in Rome or outside of Israel. However, this transliteration loses the power, the meaning, and the anointing of the name of Yeshua. I've had numerous people telling me that when they restored the name of Yeshua, that the Father gave, gave the Son, all of a sudden, ministering deliverance is a piece of cake. Why? Because the demons fear this name more than any name in the face of the earth. In fact, you can see that even when the apostles, the Jewish apostles were preaching uh, in the name of Yeshua in the temple 2,000 years ago, they were persecuted because of the name. And as you go throughout the scriptures, you will see that there is a lot of persecution because of the name. But most of the persecution is because of the name of Yeshua. Because as I said, no one has the authority to change the name. And there is only one that has been interested in that name being changed. And that one is the only enemy that we have. We don't have any other enemies. We only have one. And that is called Satan. Lucifer that became Satan, the dragon from the book of Revelation chapter 12, that ancient snake, he is the only enemy that we have. So beloved ones, as you're listening to me today, make it up in your mind right now that as I come to expose replacement theology Christianity, I am not against you, I am for you. I am not your enemy, the only one that is your enemy and the only one that's been the enemy of the true bride of Messiah and the true community of believers, the true one new man, Jew and Gentile, is Satan himself. And he made sure that he starts with changing the name, replacing it for a Greek name so that it doesn't have the same power. It is absolutely amazing, but you're going to see throughout this time that we're talking together, that in history, uh, and, and, and unfortunately, Bible seminars and Bible schools do not teach you the true history between the Jewish people and the church. That's one hidden secret. I can tell you that because I was in a very important Bible school in America called Christ for the Nations. And I'm going to tell you something. We learned and studied church history, but we never studied replacement theology. And we never studied that there has been a very bloody history between the church and the Jewish people. And that actually all the way from the 4th century and on, there has been humiliations and persecutions and hatreds and false accusations and murders and genocides and kidnapping of children and you name it against Millions and millions of Jewish people culminating in the crown of all evil, which is the Shoah, the Nazi 
Holocaust uh, through Nazi Germany that was at the time the most Protestant nation in the world and Catholic Poland where most of the death camps were where six million Jews had been exterminated and beloved ones this entire hideous thing start because the Jews were expelled out of Germany with a cross on high saying Juden Raus because you murdered Christ or Jews out because you murdered Christ. This particular line of the Jews murdered Christ will accompany the church and I, not only of the fourth century, this already by the second century and there were already some people that were Gentile church fathers that were already mentioning, well you Jews you murdered Christ and so you don't deserve to live. This particular lie has murdered more Jews than any other lie in history. This has, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, and in the name of this lie, and in the name of Christianity, there has been pogroms, inquisitions, crusades, and as I said, the Nazi Holocaust or the Nazi Shoah in the 20th century. So, beloved ones, this thing about replacement theology, this thing about the very bloody history between Christianity and the Jewish people is something that is not been known enough. Today, because we have Google, today because we have Internet, so people can Google and, and go to the Internet and find a lot of information. But that was not so until the 90s. That was uh, barely so until the 2000s. But now anybody can go and Take a look and see anti-Semitism in the church. Anti-Semitism among the church fathers. Anti-Semitism through the creeds of the church, starting with one major creed called the Nicene Creed or the Council of Nicaea that gives birth to the Nicene Creed. And we're going to talk about all of these things as I'm exposing replacement theology. And we are even going to visit the liturgy of the organization by which I'm an Archbishop Tapak at the bequest of the president of the organization, Archbishop Hackman, who requested for me to go and point within the liturgy that is today uh, consecrating bishops and archbishops that I will point replacement theology in the liturgy. I am not even going to go through the entire liturgy. I'm going to touch on three major points in the liturgy and the rest will be his story because it will unravel the entire of replacement theology within the liturgy of Tapak. But the liturgy of Tapak for the consecration of bishops and archbishops is not the only liturgy that has replacement theology. It may be some of the best ones. Uh, but there, there is many other liturgies that have replacement theology in them. I'm going to use the one that has been granted to me that I know. And by the way, for those that are listening to me today, when I became a bishop and an archbishop with Tapak, I did not declare or made vows to the liturgy. I made only vows to Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, and I only vowed that I am going to be led by the gospel made in Zion, the one that was preached by the Jewish apostles 2,000 years ago. In other words, I did not covenant myself with replacement theology when I became a bishop and an archbishop of Tapak. And I want to commend our leader, Archbishop uh, Paul Jubamita Hackman, uh, the president of Tapak, the founder, the visionary of Tapak. It's very important because he detected that I was a Jewish prophet and apostle sent to the organization so that the organization could hit the target with a vision and mission of the president of the organization. And therefore, when I did not make a vow and I did not commit myself to replacement theology within the liturgy, then he agreed to receive me as part of Tapak. And I've been an archbishop uh, with Tapak already uh, for uh, the last almost three years. And I have been a bishop with Tapak for nearly 14 years now. So I've been going to many nations and consecrating bishops and bishops that request my presence, we revise the liturgy for them so that it will not have replacement theology. But 
I want to tell you something, beloved ones. We are now talking about a future revival. We are talking about the revival of the third day. We're talking about the revival of the third millennium. And we are dealing with pastors, leaders, bishops, archbishops that are going to be installed and they need to be installed on the foundation of truth, not on the foundation that has caused the murder of millions of Jewish people throughout history and history that is highly provable. As I said, the only thing you need to do is just go ahead and Google anti-Semitism in the church and anti-Semitism in the Council of Nicaea and anti-Semitism in the creeds and anti-Semitism in the uh, theologies of the Gentile church fathers, people that are well known like John Chrysostom or Saint Augustine or Saint Jerome or uh, the Bishop of Lyon and there is so many more, even Martin Luther. You can find all that googling it online and we'll not have all the time for everything during uh, this time and this TV program, but I want you to understand that what I'm saying has ample base of proof and therefore there's nothing to worry about concerning that this is not substantiated. The only thing we're going to have to worry about when I'm finished talking is are we going to repent from replacement theology or are we going going to not repent from replacement theology? Are we going to remove it from our liturgies? Are we going to remove it from our ministries? Or are we not going to remove it from our ministries? My job is to tell you the truth. Your job will be to respond to the truth and whatever your response will be will direct the course of your life, your ministry, and your connection with Israel, and your connection with the God of Israel, with Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, and with a third day revival. I know that introduction sounds pretty long, but it's about the Council of Nicaea. Now, before I go ahead and dismantle the Nicene Creed itself and show you how replacement theology is not even only in the Council of Nicaea, but in the Nicene Creed itself, I actually want to go ahead and tell you what the Council of Nicaea says, because the Nicene Creed is based on the Council of Nicaea. And I'm going to tell you what the Council of Nicaea says. Are you ready for this? I am quoting from the letter of the Emperor Constantine to all those that are not present at the council. I'm sure you were not present at the council because this was in year 325 AD. When the question relative to the sacred festival of Easter arose, it was universally thought that it would be convenient that all should keep the feast on one day, for what could be more beautiful and more desirable than to see this festival through which we receive the hope of immortality celebrated by all with one accord and in the same manner. It was declared to be particular and worthy for this, the holiest of festivals, to follow the customs or the calculation of the Jews, who had soiled their hands with the most fearful of crimes and whose minds were blinded. In rejecting their custom, we may transmit to our descendants the legitimate mode of celebrating Easter, which we have observed from the time of the Savior's Passion according to the day of the week. We ought not therefore to have anything in common with the Jew, for the Savior has shown us another way. Our worship following a more legitimate and more convenient course, the order of the days of the week, and consequently in unanimously adopting this mode, we desire, dearest brethren, to separate ourselves from the detestable company of the Jew. For it is truly shameful for us to hear them boast that without their direction we could not keep this feast. How can they be in the right they, who after the death of the Savior have no longer been led by reason but by wild violence and their, as their delusion may urge them? They do not possess the truth in this Easter question, for in their blindness and repugnance to all improvement, they frequently celebrate two Passovers in the same year. We could not imitate those who are openly in error. How then could we follow these Jews who are most certainly blinded by error, for to celebrate a Passover twice in one year is totally 
inadmissible. But even if this were not so, it would still be your duty not to tarnish your soul by communication with such wicked people, the Jews. You should consider not only that the number of churches in these provinces make a majority, but also that it is right to demand what our reason approves and that we should have nothing in common with the Jews. Glean from Dr. Henry R. Percival, the Nicene and post-Nicene. Fathers, beloved ones, I'm going to tell you something. Replacement theology is solidified as church doctrine established and founded in 325 by the Council of Nicaea. From that moment, it was forbidden to have anything in common with the Jews. But if we have nothing in common with the Jews, then obviously we can have nothing in common with the Jewish Messiah. Because even Revelation 5.5 5 says, that it is only the lion from the tribe of Judah, the only one that is allowed to open the book of judgments. In other words, by one Jew, the world gets saved, and by one Jew, the world gets judged. Not to repent from the council of Nicaea and its ensuing creeds. It's actually not being willing to go into the third day revival where about we reconnect back again to the original gospel as preached by the Jewish apostles 2,000 years ago, where we reconnect back to Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, the Lion from the tribe of Judah, and not to Babylonian and uh, replacement theology Christianity. And if we do not reconnect even back to the very name of the Messiah, Yeshua, instead of Jesus Christ, so we can know that his identity is Jewish from the beginning to the end. Now, now that I've established the Council of Nicaea, and I read it to you, and you see that the first thing that is done when bishops and archbishops are installed is to declare the Nicene Creed that is the first and the big part of replacement theology in the liturgy. There are other parts, but I want to deal with this part in depth right now. So first of all, I told you that this was uh, established by Constantine and the bishops of the 4th century, year 325, that unanimously agreed to separate completely from the Jewish people. I already told you that you separate from the Jews, you separate it from the gospel. Let me tell you, beloved ones, that there is no salvation without the Jews. Let me tell you, beloved ones, that there is no Bible without the Jews. Let me tell you, beloved ones, that there is no Savior without the Jews. Let me tell you, beloved ones, that there would have been no Jewish apostles to preach a gospel to the nations. There would have been no Apostle Paul Shaul from Tarsus had it not been from the Jews. Exposure of replacement theology will continue in our next program with Archbishop Dominica Bierman. Shalom. I want to tell you about a book that tells the story of how God reached my wife, the Archbishop. She was an Israeli tour guide, and God started speaking to her on one of her tours. That's right, God speaks today. And he spoke to a non-saved Israeli tour guide. And when she told God, yes, I want you to be my Messiah, it changed her whole life, put her and I together a couple weeks later, and we've been together ever since. Read her book, yes, it'll set many people free. I will bless them. That bless thee, I will curse them that curse thee. All the families of the earth will now be blessed. As we rise up together and reach out to all the nations, grafted in the 